Welcome to Bar Ilan University. Uh, my name is Carl Skolevsky. I'm the Dean of the Israeli Faculty of Medicine of Bar Ilan University. That faculty is located in the north of Israel in Sfat. The main campus is in the Tel Aviv area. And it's a privilege and pleasure for me to welcome everyone to this very special Bar Ilan uh, webinar series over the month of November, today being the first. Uh, entitled, When the End is Just the Beginning, the COVID-19 Vaccine Challenge. Five um, webinars on vaccines, pandemics, and public health systems, uh, and really enabled uh, and put together by uh, Professor Michael Edelstein, who's gonna take over in a minute. Uh, I'll just take a minute to um, introduce him. Obviously, the discourse in uh, COVID-19 is rapidly now shifting a bit uh, to vaccines. Um, and that's why I think the timing is just perfect, especially with Israel yesterday, having had its first patient get an Israeli made vaccine. So um, this timing uh, is pretty good uh, and a lot, lot to discuss and expectations. Um, Michael um, is also came, came to join bar Ilan University, moved to Israel just in time, um, one month ago. Um, so his background is uh, born in France, uh, spent much of his time in England, uh, MD graduate uh, in England from Birmingham, and then uh, specialized research and clinically and in public health in London, uh, was in, appointed to associate professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, moved to Israel, as I mentioned, began his academic, moved in August with his family's academic appointment just, just a month ago. Um, I think Michael is, is very well known to many in the audience, but for those who don't, he uh, specializes in infectious disease epidemiology and vaccines in particular. Uh, we didn't know this. We didn't know about COVID-19 when we recruited him, of course. We recruited him before, uh, but some prescient uh, thinking. He has a strong uh, operational research and academic record. Um, is very well connected to national global health organizations, whether, whether they be the WHO, European and US CDC, Public Health England, uh, focuses on immunization inequalities, general inequalities in health, improving immunization data quality and use, harnessing the potential of digital health uh, and data science to improve, improve and to measure and improve public health outcomes, build strong collaboration networks. Uh, he's very um, well sought after and important positions such as president of the infectious disease control section of the European Public Health Association, that's one of many, many examples. I can't give them all. Um, he's published widely, supervised students, is already attracting and building a strong research group here at Bar Ilan in no time. Uh, a lot of field experience, I, too much to mention. I'll just mention one, for example, he was a WHO advisor to the polio eradication program in Burkina Faso. In three days, two and a half million children received polio vaccine. Um, he's been in, in the Swedish health system. So really uh, very global. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and just say that uh, we're grateful to Bar Ilan's um, leadership for um, enabling also this important recruitment to the state of Israel uh, of such a distinguished um, population health uh, practitioner and academic leader uh, who's put together the series. And I'd like to say that the president, as we heard, Professor Aryeh Saban, uh, president of the university who also recruited me to Bar Ilan, <laughs> also is on the line and is part of this uh, webinar series. And uh, just want to welcome him to say a few word or two, a greeting for, for a second to, to Michael and, uh, and to us. Thank you, Carl. I'll say a word or, or two. Thank you very much for putting up this series. I'm very excited, looking forward to hear. And uh, thank you, Professor Skoretsky, Professor Edelstein, and Professor Hyman, who will give the lecture. I'm here listening. Okay, Michael, please take over. Thank you, Carl, and thanks for the very uh, extensive uh, introduction. Mine will be slightly briefer. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm very excited about this, this webinar series. And uh, when I was thinking about who to invite, um, I couldn't really think of uh, anyone better than 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 Professor Heyman to to open uh, the series? Uh, for those who most of you will know or will have heard of uh, of of David, but he's one of the 
uh, foremost experts in, in infectious disease epidemiology um, and has advised uh, national governments and UN agencies on multiple um, outbreaks and pandemics, SARS, Ebola, and now um, COVID-19. He's also a, a vaccine expert. And I think, um, well, hopefully his, um, his words should should be should be uh, interpreted as 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 words of wisdom and um, and will will we'll really um, I think help all of us have uh, a realistic and um, and comprehensive overview of what to expect uh, with um, a, a now almost not not certain but a vaccine that is looking uh, more and more likely in the in the short or medium term. So. Um, David, I'll, I'll leave it over to you. I'll just give a, a couple of um, housekeeping rules. We're going to keep questions to the end. And if you do have questions, you can type them in the chat addressed to myself at any point, And I'll relay those to, uh, to Professor Heyman uh, after his intervention. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, David, over to you. Thanks very much, Michael. It's really a pleasure to, to be working with you again. Uh, Michael really made some incredibly important contributions here in the UK and, and elsewhere, as you've heard. And you're very fortunate to have uh, been able to attract him to the university. I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm to be talking about a vaccine for COVID-19. And I would just say that a vaccine is certainly not the whole answer. And I'd like to be able to convince you um, during this next 45 minutes or even less that the vaccine really is not the whole answer, but it certainly would be useful and important as we move ahead. So let me see if I can start here by just talking about the four coronaviruses that are in humans at present. And you all know about these. These viruses all came from the animal kingdom at some time in history. And they're seasonal. They cause a peak in the winter, early spring months in the Northern Hemisphere, and usually a mild disease in the upper respiratory tract. And as for the current coronavirus, the elderly are hit the most seriously with these infections. And I'd like to just focus on one of these, and that's the human coronavirus OC43, because I think it's very important in the context of what's going on at present to understand a little bit about this coronavirus or a little bit about the hypotheses. And those hypotheses generate around a molecular clock analysis of the spike gene sequences of this virus. And what you can see on this graph is the points where on the right, where there have been sequences of known human coronaviruses that were isolated since the 1950s. And a linear regression takes them back to a period between 1850 and 1819, when they might have resembled the bovine coronavirus from which they're expected to have um, emerged. And so looking back through three different methods, through linear regression, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian coalescence, we find a period between 1850 and 1900 when this virus may have been similar to the bovine virus. If you look at the Russian influenza pandemic in 1889 and 1893, you could even add more to that hypothesis, suggesting that the emergence may have been associated with a pandemic. Because this was called an influenza pandemic, but there was never an influenza virus isolated from because there are no specimens that exist from this time. But there were approximately 1 million deaths worldwide, which would count for a serious viral infection with bacterial superinfections. There were neurological symptoms in this, which was not consistent with influenza. And so the hypothesis could be that this was when the emergence occurred of the bovine human um, coronavirus, human bovine coronavirus, which is now endemic in human populations. If you look at the emergence since 2003, there have been um, three other um, coronavirus emergences. And in each of these, there have been attempts at a vaccine. And I just wanted to walk through a little bit of the epidemiology of this, as well as the vaccines, because really you can't develop a vaccine without understanding the epidemiology. 
So if we want a successful SARS coronavirus 2 vaccine, we need to also understand the epidemiology because that will tell us how this vaccine might be best used. And so I'd start with SARS and you know, many of you will remember that the first um, um, inkling that this might have, uh, have been something which was occurring in China came in February 21st. Now, prior to February 21st, in fact, for two and a half months, there were rumors of a respiratory infection in China causing high mortality. But it was not until one of those health workers came into Hong Kong, stayed one night in a hotel. He was sick. He was a doctor who had been treating these patients, was sick. And he stayed in a room on um, one of the floors of that hotel. And his room is indicated in green. You can see in the yellow rooms were people who were staying on that same hotel floor who returned to their home countries um, in a few days and ended up with a very similar disease to what this doctor had had. And if you look at the red spots, those are areas on the carpet in front of this patient's room and also in front of the lifts were actually several weeks after this occurred when it was known that this was a new virus, PCR fragments of that virus were found on the carpet. So this was the start of a pandemic which spread around the world. It was first identified in a businessman in Vietnam who had stayed overnight in that hotel on the 21st of February. The outbreak was very important because it was a lower respiratory infection and aerosolization procedures in pulmonary hygiene infected health workers who were unsuspecting. And you can see here that this virus infected not only health workers, but also uh, other patients, visitors, and a husband. So in fact, this virus was spread quite easily both to health workers and to others. And health workers unfortunately amplified transmission when they returned home with infection into the community. This virus was very transmissible late after symptoms and signs had developed. In fact, maximum transmissibility was thought to be seven to eight days after signs and symptoms developed, unlike the current coronavirus. And um, there was also an indication that this transmitted in fecal material um, from an outbreak that occurred in a complex apartment complex in Hong Kong, where the sewerage line, which you can see on the outside of the building, became blocked one evening when there was a person on the top floor who was quite sick with a diarrheal infection. And that blockage forcefully opened up the next morning. Um, and when it did so, it's thought that it went into all of the bathing areas of people because the valves in the evacuation from the bathing areas were old, were not effective. And the force of that deblocking of the sewage system forced uh, aerosols into the bathing areas so that there were over 200 people who were infected during a period of probably an hour when they were taking their, when they were bathing in the bathing areas. And we knew, we learned rapidly that this virus transmitted very easily around the world, both on airlines and other ways. And the outbreak, in fact, was an outbreak which was um, amplified in transmission by health workers in the light gray, um, which is common with many emerging infections. The outbreak ended very rapidly within a period of five months with some very severe travel recommendations made by the Director General of WHO. And there was vaccine development. That vaccine development was quite healthy by the time of May or April, May or June, um, when the virus was continuing to spread around the world. But unfortunately, it slowed when the outbreak ended. But what's important is that the learning from this vaccine development was available, was available to use in the current outbreak and in the MERS corona outbreak, was the next, which was the next outbreak. So MERS coronavirus was found in, um, in Saudi Arabia first, and it was identified by Dr. Zaki, who immediately published the sequence on the web. A month later here in London at St. Thomas Hospital, there was a patient who came in with a severe respiratory syndrome. The virus was isolated, sequenced, and turned out to be very similar to that virus that Zaki had put out on the web the sequence uh, one month earlier. This was a 49-year-old previously well Qatari male who had a very serious illness and a very long course of hospitalization, as you can see. He was in the hospital almost a year 
and after 12 months uh, deceased from his infection. But he owned a camel farm. He had been in Saudi Arabia, so he had many risk factors for this infection, and he had a common um, respiratory infection. This virus came into the UK again and caused a small cluster of disease in someone who was living um, in the same household with the patient who was a contact in the hospital. And as we know, this virus spread around the world um, and caused major outbreaks. And a major, the major, most major was in South Korea, where infection prevention and control permitted the infection from one imported case to spread to over 200 people and cause 38 deaths in several different hospitals. So we know the epidemiology of this coronavirus as well. We know that it's carried in the nasal passages of healthy camels. We know that camels probably are infected from bats. We know that it's a, a very dangerous infection in hospitals if there's not good infection prevention and control. And there's some household transmission, but very little, if any, community transmission. So where does the vaccine belong for this virus? Does it belong in a human or does it belong in a camel? And I think this is a question that we should be considering because there are camel vaccines. Those vaccines could possibly, if they're a conjugate vaccine, prevent nasal carriage in the camel and prevent the continued emergence of this infection. But is a vaccine more effective in humans? And how would you really use it in humans? Certainly, with a vaccine that's nosocomially transmitted, it would be very hard to decide who should be vaccinated, except possibly health workers, but other patients would be at risk. So, you know, it's really important to understand the epidemiology before we make decisions about a vaccine. And so vaccine manufacturers who are manufacturing vaccines must be sure that they're listening to the epidemiological community to know where those vaccines might be most useful. So today we're, we're um, witnessing, we're actually living the emergence of a new coronavirus, that third human coronavirus since 2003. And this is the SARS coronavirus 2. We know how it's spread. It's spread by contact directly by droplet face to face. It's transferred by aerosols from someone who coughs or sings or speaks within a meter. And those aerosols can become airborne in greater than a meter and can actually spread the virus further. But we need to remember that that virus is only living as long as the mucus that's surrounding it remains intact and remains moist. So when that dries out from an aerosol that continues to be airborne, it is no longer effective, infected. Also, we know that this virus can be isolated from feces in a few instances, but that that's not a major means of transmission. And we know the points of entry, the eyes, nose, and mouth. We also um, know from studies done in Japan and from other elsewhere that the smaller droplets um, drop out, the heavy droplets drop out very rapidly, those that are uh, red, and the blue can go on and cause aerosol transmission and eventually airborne transmission. We know from studies that were never really peer reviewed in China that this virus does transmit very easily in closed situations. And I'm telling you all this because this is part of the formula of how we live with this virus today while we're waiting for a vaccine. So we all know that closed, closed areas are very important. And what this shows you at the top right is the sketch of a bus going to a Buddhist uh, festival in China. On that bus, there was one person who was sick with a respiratory infection. Travel was 50 um, minutes each way, and there were two buses, bus one and bus two. Bus two had this sick person on board, and 23 of those people on that bus were found to be infected at some point after the religious festival. In the temple, there were seven people who were infected from 232 people, which included both those busloads of people in the temple. And seven of those were infected, plus the 23 who were infected from the uh, bus. So we believe that closed spaces are really very important in transmission of this. That's why mask wearing is so important if physical distancing is not possible. We also know from another study in China, which again, 
was never peer reviewed, that it may be that there is um, airborne transmission from those aerosols because there was a person sitting at table A who had a respiratory infection, was coughing, was sneezing, and infected four people um, at his table who eventually were shown to have a SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Sitting at table A and C, there were also people who were infected, but sitting at other tables, in fact, at 15 other tables, 68 persons were not infected. So there's a hypothesis that the air conditioning unit nudged those aerosols coming from this person who was sick a little bit further and circulated them around so that people got infected in the immediate uh, area where that person was sitting. And we know from the study of Acquire that practiced for two hours in the state of Washington, that transmission is very efficient in closed spaces. We also know from studies in um, Japan that nightclubs are where the majority of transmission was occurring in parts of Japan. And as we'll talk later on, Japan, what they did was they didn't close down their entire economy. In fact, Asian countries have never shut down their entire economies. That's a practice that's done by European countries. Asian countries followed the epidemiological model of finding out where transmission was occurring, locking that down, rectifying the situation, opening cautiously, and locking down if necessary. And they've been able to keep this virus at bay. So, but Japan also very early showed that this was not transmitting as does influenza, which is what many of the modelers were thinking and which many of the modelers used as they recommended these major shutdowns in Europe and other parts of the world. Influenza, when it transmits, comes into a community or into a country and spreads almost instantaneously into communities. It doesn't cause discrete outbreaks, as you know. COVID-19, however, does cause discrete outbreaks. And those outbreaks can be traced both prospectively and retrospectively, as good epidemiology teaches us. The cluster can be identified, contacts can be self-isolated, and you can prevent some transmission into the community if you have your diagnostic test linked to your outbreak containment and if results come in rapidly. It does, it's not on if results as here in the UK come in a day later. That's not effective. You need to have linkage to your system immediately so you can identify persons and find their contacts and get them isolated. At the same time, retrospective study does show you where transmission is occurring and you can epidemiologically, surgically shut down those areas of transmission while you keep the rest of the areas where transmission is not occurring open and permit the society to function in more or less a, a, a stable uh, way going forward or a sustainable way. Lots of confusion occurs though about whether or not we should just let everybody get infected and have herd immunity develop. Well, as you know, there are two caveats to that. Number one, we don't understand what happens when people get infected in the long term, even those who are asymptomatically infected or have mild infection. What is the long-term sequelae? And the second thing is we understand very little about immunity and whether that immunity is protective against infection or whether it modifies infection in such a way that there's less serious illness. But to talk about herd immunity, and we usually do this for vaccines, but we can also do it for population health. When there's a reproductive number, for example, of four, what you see is four people who get infected from one person if there's unrestrained transmission. And then that person goes on, each person goes on to infect four more. If you have that same reproductive number and three of those people are immune as shown in the bottom, then of course you have less transmission and that's already the beginning of herd immunity. And that's a very important consideration to think through moving forward if indeed infection does prevent reinfection. And we believe it does for a certain amount of time as do the other coronaviruses, but you know that there are already 25 known reinfections that have occurred in people who have had disease in the past. So what are the rules for herd immunity? Well, number one, depends on the reproductive number, but herd immunity is the indirect protection of susceptible individuals from infection when a sufficient portion of the population is immune. 
And the herd immunity threshold is that point at which the proportion of a population that is susceptible falls below the level needed for transmission. Very simple in paper, very difficult for modelers and others to really understand. And it's just not correct that people are saying, well, we'll wait for herd immunity when we don't understand enough to say that at present. But there are some rules we should consider about herd immunity, if indeed it should develop. One of those is that naturally occurring herd immunity from infection with significant mortality may occur only with an unacceptable level of mortality. And that's very important to understand about diseases such as SARS coronavirus, which do have an unacceptable level of mort mortality, especially in those with comorbidities in the elderly. But the second point is even more important as we think about what might happen with herd immunity for SARS coronavirus too. If a disease is not uniformly lethal throughout a population, as is the case for SARS coronavirus, and if the population with lowest risk of mortality is the population with the highest contact rate, which is what's occurring because it's the young people in Europe at least who took off after the lockdown was opened up and began to congregate again, becoming infected. So if the lowest risk of mortality is in the population with the highest contact rate, naturally occurring herd immunity may occur with a more acceptable level of mortality because it will decrease transmission to those people who are at greatest risk. And the third thing to understand for countries like Israel and Europe is that strict non-pharmaceutical interventions such as complete lockdowns do suppress virus transmission, but they decrease the ability to create herd immunity should it be important moving forward. And finally, vaccination with long lasting immunity in all populations is the most sure way of attaining herd immunity. And that can be shown in this slide, which shows you the threshold of immunity for influenza, rubella, and measles. What you can see here <clears throat> at the bottom is the reproductive number very high. And Michael knows very well for measles, the reproductive rate is between um, 10, uh, 12 to 15. And if you have a reproductive number that high, you must have an extremely high threshold, almost 90 to 92% in order to have any immunity, herd immunity impact and to decrease transmission in all populations. So herd immunity is what we talk about. And here's what you can see is happening in Europe. You can see that really there is very little population immunity being developed at present by transmission. And I think most countries believe that their transmission or their um, antibody levels are less than 15%. But please remember also that we don't know what those antibodies are doing. We don't know what cellular immunity is doing. But we do know that there's a world with um, inequality in where the virus is occurring. And we can see from this slide that there are um, 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 many differences in the way transmission is occurring. Africa and um, the Western Pacific region have the lowest levels of transmission there at the bottom of the graph. And Africa has that because probably we believe um, there are many different dynamics going on. Number one, their population mean is 18 years of age, so less serious infection. Elders live in communities away from um, the young people who are in the cities, so maybe it just has not arrived there yet and maybe they're just not testing enough to find it. But we do know that the Western Pacific region, which includes Japan, Singapore, um, um, South Korea, Taiwan, and, um, and Vietnam, are sustaining their response by doing just what you saw Japan is doing, identifying where transmission is occurring through good epidemiological investigation and contact tracing, locking that down, opening it cautiously after they've tried to rectify the situation whether it's in schools, whether it's in nightclubs, or whether it's elsewhere in their societies. So we're left um, with um, um, some research, sorry. We're left with research, which is very important, which is going on at present. There are various types of vaccine under development and study. We don't know, as you'll see later on, whether those vaccines will provide protection against infection, whether they'll provide protection against serious illness in people who are infected, or if it does prevent infection, how long it will actually be effective. 
We have also repurposed drugs, which are being um, used in some instances, and certainly corticosteroids are very important. And we have plasmapheresis and monoclonal antibodies. And we have some very encouraging studies being done with monoclonal antibodies, which may actually be available in license before a vaccine. And that would completely change the way countries might want to deal with this outbreak going forward. In fact, if there were good monoclonal antibodies that could be injected too early in infection to prevent serious illness or even to prevent infection, because that was, that's what was done before there was, for example, a hepatitis A vaccine, we may see a whole change in the dynamic of outbreaks and the change of how we would deal with these outbreaks. And finally, we have antigen and antibody tests, including point of care diagnostics, which are being developed in addition to the PCR. So we've got several things that we can do today, living with the SARS coronavirus, and maybe we should be spending more time on that and less, spending, less time spending on, spent on suppressing the virus. We maybe should be doing what's being done in Asian countries. They rapidly detect people with infection, outbreaks, and sites of increased transmission. They um, look for influenza-like and acute respiratory infections through their surveillance systems linked to rapid SARS coronavirus 2 testing. They isolate and manage people with infection as people do in Israel and elsewhere, healthcare facilities or at home. They investigate outbreaks that I'm sure that Israel is doing, finding and closing down sources of infection. They're decreasing community transmission by contact tracing and community trust and participation. The UK is trying to manage contact tracing centrally. It doesn't work. It works where there's trust where people at the community level, at the district level, or at the local government level have confidence in people who are already doing contact tracing for TB or for sexually transmitted infections. And we can strengthen our control measures by making sure that populations are understanding, as in Asia, how to protect themselves and protect others. You know, Asians have a habit of wearing masks, not only because they feel it's important to wear it in the general population, but because they have a feeling of responsibility for their neighbors and they don't want to infect others. So even for the common cold, they wear a mask. So for them, it's been not too difficult to understand that mask wearing is extremely important to protect others and that physically distancing is very important as well as hand washing in preventing infection itself. So that's the beginning of a checklist that we can all be using to live with SARS coronavirus and possibly avoid disruptive lockdowns. Because lockdowns are many times political promises while they're waiting for a vaccine, which may or may not come. The next thing we can do is ensure that testing is most strategic using most cost-effective use of nucleic antigen and antibody testing. And this is especially true in countries that don't have the resources to do nucleic acid PCR testing. They should be using antigen testing. There are two point of care diagnostic tests developed um, to detect antigen that have gone through rigorous study and fine diagnostics and can be used effectively, one from South Korea, one from um, Roche. They should be used and, and, and encouraged to be used to detect rapidly patients who might need to be isolated. We need to protect the health and social care system, monitoring bed availability, making sure we have space for people who are infected and make sure there's good infection prevention and control and mask wearing in health facilities. Continue to mitigate by postponing large mass gatherings. Involve the business and private sectors because getting people back to work is good for everybody. And it's also good to get students back into school situations as well. And apply short-term preventive and mitigation measures if you do find places where transmission is occurring. And finally, make sure that that research which is developing a vaccine in Israel is continued so that we have the tools that are necessary. Now, what type of vaccine will be available for SARS coronavirus 2? We've already talked about that. We don't know. It may be that the vaccine will be available that will prevent infection and it may prevent infection for six months, require a booster. There may be genetic drift, which requires updating of vaccines, but there may be a protective vaccine. Most people are saying that if 50% efficacy is possible with a vaccine, 
that will help us out in the near term. At the same time, um, there are vaccines that may prevent, um, inf not prevent infection, but modify the way disease expresses itself so that it's mild and, as and remains asymptomatic or mild. So we just don't know what a vaccine will deliver to us, and we don't know what its effectiveness or its efficacy will be. But we do know that even if a vaccine offers 80% immunity, there will still be efficacy. There will still be people who are infected. So we need to really hope that we have a vaccine because that will be a valuable tool in our fight against um, um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but political promises that we're going to suppress until a vaccine should really be discouraged. We need to learn to live with this virus. This virus will become endemic if that's its destiny, even if we have a vaccine, but we can use that vaccine appropriately in healthcare workers and possibly in others, including those with comorbidity and the elderly. How close is the world to a vaccine? Well, there are none yet approved. There are um, several in phase three, nine of them, 18 in phase two, 29 in phase three and 142 being developed. So unprecedented research on developing vaccines. And this is extremely important that we continue that research moving forward. Some of those vaccines are new concepts an RNA vaccine would be wonderful if it works. Think of how easily it could be produced even in developing countries. So all of these studies are very important moving forward. And what's even more important is to make sure that there is equitable access once a vaccine is available. And that's why the ACT accelerator is so important. And that's why I'm so unhappy that my country, the United States, has not even become a part of this ACT accelerator, which will make vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics available within countries around the world. In fact, there's already a high-performing COVID antigen RDT, which is being distributed to countries around the world at a cost of three US dollars per dose by the Fine Diagnostics Initiative through this um, ACT accelerator. And there's also the COVAX initiative, which is moving forward which will make sure that there's more equitable distribution of vaccines. So Michael, that's what I had to say in um, maybe many, too many words, but I just wanted to encourage people to think about vaccines as not the solution, but as one of the many solutions and to not let our governments make false promises that cannot be met in the immediate future. So back to you, Michael, and thanks very much again for having invited me to speak with you. David, thank you very much for um, for this comprehensive overview and reminding us that, um, of course, vaccine development is important, but there are, you know, tried and tested methods of managing outbreaks and sometimes the basics get forgotten. And we're seeing this in, in, in many countries. Um, we have a few we have a few questions from the audience and I'm going to relay them to you, David, in a minute. I just want to remind the audience that if you do have um, questions, please type them in the chat, um, either to everyone or, or to myself, and, uh, and we'll discuss them. The first question um, comes from uh, Mr. Dominicus Husada, who's asking about the role of particular age groups and specifically um, children, teenagers and elderly in terms of their role in, in, in the epidemiology of the disease and whether they require um, specific attention or measures. Well, I expect that uh, as in many countries in Europe and Israel, um, the majority of transmission after the lockdowns occurred because youth were finding other youth, and this means teenagers and, and young adults, um, becoming social again, socializing again, because it was a very difficult situation for many, especially those who were uh, locked down sing in single uh, units to, to, to face that lockdown. And so when they were able to socialize again, they moved out, at least that's what happened in the UK and in Europe, they moved out and congregated again and probably facilitated transmission. Because most European countries locked down without an exit strategy. They locked down impulsively to suppress transmission and waiting for something to come along, possibly a vaccine, but a decent exit strategy would have understood that you need to unlock slowly 
and unlock certain sectors that you know are not at risk, while others you need to keep locked down until you can deal better with them. So what happened was from day to night, there was unlocking a massive amount of transmission, probably in the late teens and the youth uh, and, and young adults who were getting together and transmitting it then taking it home to their households and amplifying transmission in that way. So that's the hypothesis that I would put out for this. Um, school children, um, surprisingly, we don't believe that they are playing a role in a major role in transmission because in countries where there's surveillance in families of school children, it's very rare to find infections. And when those infections are found, they can usually be, um, be attributed to something other than a school child who might be infected. In fact, when households with students get infected, um, it's very rare that the child is infected. So for some reason, it appears that children are not playing at present a major role in transmission. Thanks, David. Um, I'm just getting a request that perhaps you could um, unshare your screen so we can see we can see everyone if that's if that's okay. Absolutely, yes. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, no problem. Um, we have another question from uh, Christine Stable from the University of Southern Denmark, and she's asking. Uh, there's actually two questions. The first one is: Are you aware of um, a seroprevalence study in Japan? which showed that seroprevalence increased from 6% to 45%, 46%, sorry, over the course of the summer, and um, whether that's a, a, a result that uh, tell us something about the potential for achieving herd immunity through natural infection. I am aware that in some parts of some countries, in Germany, for example, they, I think they have about 27, or in Sweden, rather, about 27% in one area, Germany about 15%. I'm not aware of the Japanese study. I don't know in what area it occurred. But the real problem, as we all know, is that antibodies are very difficult to detect in this infection, especially in those who had mild or asymptomatic infections. And so, you know, what we're seeing, what was on that graph I showed is just um, the, um, the mean with the confidence uh, uh, limits around it. And it could certainly go up to 40% in some areas. Whether or not, you know, I would, I think everybody would like to say we would love to see herd immunity develop by having the people who have less severe infections being infected. But the caveat, of course, is we don't have that cohort study done yet or those studies done yet to tell us what long term outcomes of infection are. And so that's really the, the, the stumbling block in recommending that we just do what Sweden did, although Sweden is a very important country to watch and see what's happening in Sweden as time goes on. I don't know if that answered the question. Maybe, I think Denmark has done some studies too. Maybe um, the participant could talk a little bit about what's going on in Denmark. Um, Michael? Um, I, I don't think we can open the, okay. the, it's, the, the participants are blocked from, from unmuting, okay. unfortunately. Um, but I'll, she, there's an, an, another question from the same uh, person asking about in the, in situations where perhaps um, the, the, the capacity of the system to contact trace is overwhelmed. Is there any value in a stratified contact tracing system with extra focus on those with high viral load um, and perhaps tracing them longer back? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Certainly, um, countries have given up on contact tracing in many places, but, but you can usually find areas where there are discrete outbreaks, not in the high transmission areas, but in the low transmission areas. And that's where the future lies in being able to get into those areas and do the contact tracing. And it is possible, um, you know, I remember Bill Fagy, who many of you will know, Bill Fagy is, um, was the guru of public health in the US. He, um, he was the one who developed the strategy for smallpox eradication. He was um, the director of CDC for a time. And um, he was my first boss in India when I worked with smallpox eradication. And during the Ebola outbreak, um, we were meeting once a week with Margaret Chan, Bill Fagy, and three others and myself, just informally. And Bill kept telling Margaret, Margaret, you have to count, you have to start contact tracing. And Margaret kept saying, we can't do it. Transmission is too widespread in the, in the uh, urban areas. Bill said, you have to do it. And he continued to say that. And once they did start it, it worked, but they didn't start it 
from the central level in the municipal areas. They went into the neighborhoods and they started it there. And so, you know, whether or not high, tighter people should be the ones to follow, or whether you should find cases in a neighborhood and let the neighborhood do the investigations is not clear. But certainly there are places where you can do effective contact tracing and stop outbreaks in rural areas or in areas where transmission is not so high a level. Not a good question, not a good answer, but best I could do. Thanks. The, the questions are piling up, so we're going to try and go through as many as we can. Um, the next question is actually from Professor Skoretsky asking um, you, David, whether you think there's a need to check for um, for antibody levels prior to vaccination, whether there's any uh, um, you know, potential um, implications with prior natural infection prior to, to vaccination. Such as enhancement. Yeah, and I just don't know. I think we know so little about immunity um, that we really have a lot, a long way to go. And that's why, you know, um, uh, any of you, I started CDC in 1976. And the year I started CDC, the US had just been vaccinated for swine flu, thinking that there was going to be a pandemic of a virus that was identified in military recruits for discs in New Jersey. That vaccination campaign ended up with um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which was quite significant which caused the manufacturers and the government an incredible amount of money, caused damage to many lives going forward, and drove the vaccine industry out of the US for several years. So, you know, rushing in too rapidly um, in, with things such as enhancement, which happened with the dengue vaccine, as you know, in the Philippines, is a question that we have to answer. So that's why we have to go very slowly on this, but rapidly enough to be able to do the risk benefit analysis that says, even if there is enhancement, it might be at this level, therefore we should be vaccinating that population. But it will take a lot of, of really important epidemiological understanding before vaccines can be safely used. Thanks. Um, the next question is from uh, Suzanne Hane at the um, RIVM in the Netherlands. Um, and she's asking, um, whether it makes sense to set a target for R in terms of um, control strategy? And if so, what do you think is the, is the right target? Setting an R value uh, less than one is certainly what we'd all like to see. But if a country decides that they want to control the entrance of the virus and keep it at a low level and out of certain populations, then they might want a slightly higher reproductive number. So I think, it, Michael, it depends on what the long-term strategy of the country is, whether or not they want to see this establish itself more, uh, more rapidly than if they just suppress completely. And, and, you know, I can't answer that question, but reproductive number is, is important. But what's even more important, Michael, right now is for countries to understand that they can't be comparing each other. They can't be comparing to other countries using cases reported by WHO. Because what those cases are, are the numbers of infections that have occurred in a country uh, that have been diagnosed in a country based on that country's testing strategy. And WHO doesn't record the testing strategy. So we don't know. A country that's reporting uh, fewer cases may be, may be testing fewer people. And so using those as an indicator of international travel is not a way to go. And actually, um, the committee that I chair at WHO, which is advising on the epidemic, we meet twice a week, um, is not right now working on a framework that countries can use for risk assessment, and it will not include infections reported. Thanks for that. Um, we have a time for a couple more. Um, the next one I think is quite important, uh, and I'm sure you will have seen, like I have, the, the recent study um, that's from, from England that shows at population level a decrease in uh, seroprevalence. Um, what do you think, uh, what does that mean? What are the consequences for potential duration of protection of a vaccine? Well, what's important is the recall capacity of those individuals who have a decreasing antibody level. I mean, antibody is like anything else. It has a half-life and it disappears over time or it decreases over time. So I think it's not surprising. I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how long detectable antibody lasts after measles vaccination, for example. Michael, you may know how long detectable antibody remains. But what's important is that recall ability to produce antibody when necessary. Yeah. 
And so, you know, I think, you know, this is important to know that antibody levels do decrease. But remember, we don't have any yet correlate of protection. We don't know if antibody is a correlate of protection or not. Um, do you mind if I just add one little thing to this? Because I think Please that do, the, yeah. the, the, the concern um, and that's been reported in the, in the press is that um, decreasing levels of antibody, detectable antibodies equals loss of immunity. Uh, and as you've said, that's that's not not necessarily the case, is because because there are other mechanisms of uh, of immunity through through, for example, memory cells, like like you've mentioned. So I think um, I think it's an important finding, but it doesn't necessarily equate with individuals losing immunity. And I would add, I don't know what you think about this, that the fact that we, we're actually, you know, we're seeing decreasing levels of, of antibodies in many studies around the world after about five months, but no, um, no mass phenomenon of reinfection. Reinfection seems to be re relatively anecdotal at this stage, um, you know, implies, or at least, um, you know, hints that at least five, six months down the line, reinfection is it's not a, a, a major issue. It doesn't mean it won't become one further down the line, but the, the loss of antibody is not the same as loss of infection. That's right. And luck, luckily, we have a large database from the human coronaviruses that can tell us what antibody looks like as people do get infected again, because, you know, after six months, uh, the human coronaviruses that are in, endemic now don't, aren't, you know, can be infected. Um, I'm going to take one more question, and this is from um, one of my colleagues at bar -Ilan University, uh, from, from Milana Frankel Morgenstein. She's asking um, about the predictability of future waves and um, how much weight should we put on, on modeling versus, um, you know, sort of randomness of, uh, of re-emergence and, and increased incidence. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm biased. I'm a field epidemiologist, and I think that what we need to be doing is collecting the information we need to better deal with this virus now, whether it's outbreak investigation, whether it's contact tracing, whatever it is. We need to use our epidemiological skills. Modelers are important. They're very important for testing out interventions, but modeling also provides an upper and a lower level, and the press and the politicians always take the upper level. And they have to because that's what's put out in the literature. But you know, I've been talking with a colleague of mine, Paul Fine, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, because we watched in Ebola the modeling that was done for Ebola, which said build hospital beds, build hospital beds. And once communities began to do the contact tracing and became engaged, hospital beds were not needed. And in fact, they weren't even available until after the outbreak was over because the donors were building hospital beds. So modelers sometimes get it wrong. Early on, they were using flu as the model. This doesn't transmit like flu. And so what my assumption, what my understanding of modeling is, and Paul and I, I said we're talking about this, is that modelers use very complicated mathematical calculations that field epidemiologists really don't understand. And so when these articles get reviewed and published, they're published in those those, uh, those uh, journals, which have peer review by people who can review them, the modeling itself. So they say this model is sound, this model is not sound. The most important thing though is to do backwards and see whether that model predicted, prediction was true. And that's not really been done for a lot of the models that are out there presently. So a lot to say um, modeling is very important. Field epidemiology is also important. A marriage of the two is the best. Thanks, David. Before before I hand back over to Professor Skoretsky to close the session, um, I want to ask you one question, which comes from myself, but also a few other questions from the audience. It's a sort of um, synthesis, and I apologize that we can't answer everybody's questions. There's just too many. You talked a lot about Asian countries um, and how they've they've succeeded in many ways, um, many ways that Europe, the US, or Israel failed. Um, and, and I wonder what is your take on why, um, you know, why it hasn't worked in Europe? It's not an issue of capacity. It's not an issue of resources. What is it? And, you know, going forward, what, what should we do differently? What can we learn that is implementable in Europe? So, you know, for the, for the next few months, we look more like, um, Asia. I mean, Israel's in Asia, so technically, 
we should we should be in that group but um you know what 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 can we can can we start looking more like this and less like less like europe so what are what are your your take home messages for the country well you know michael um when who announced all the focal points of the international health regulations every country in the world on the 5th of january that there was a respiratory infection of an unknown cause in um, china asian countries immediately strengthened their surveillance systems. Remember, they had had SARS outbreaks, they had had MERS corona outbreaks. They strengthened their surveillance systems. And by the 20th of January, they were already finding outbreaks and stopping those outbreaks, whether it was in religious institutions, in, in there was one in, an, uh, in a Chinese pharmacy, wherever they were finding outbreaks, they stopped them. And they began that way and they continued that way. Good field epidemiology. And they got the, the testing strategies to match what they were doing so that they had rapid results. European countries also had importations about the same time, and so did North America. And for some reason, and I can't tell you why, they just either didn't come to attention or they were ignored. And then there were some problems with development of tests. Germany developed a very sound test very early on. European countries used that. The US had problems developing their tests. And you know they didn't have it right away. So I don't think, the only answer I can give you, Michael, is that these countries had SARS and MERS coronavirus outbreaks previously. They were ready. They had taken the lessons and they got themselves prepared. They have excess hospital beds in all, in all those countries that are isolation units that have built-in uh, renal dialysis and ventilators, and they can take care of excess patients. We just couldn't do that. And the reflex in Europe was more to stop, to protect the hospital system than to think about the epidemiology and what they would do once that hospital system was protected. And so the lockouts, lockdowns came, no clear exit strategy, and we are where we are today. That's my view. David, thank you very much. It's uh, we could have easily spent another 30 minutes. There's about 15 questions waiting, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, David, I really want to thank you very much for those um, really helpful insights into, um, into SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus. Uh, and I'm going to hand over back to Professor Skoretsky for, um, for some final words. I'd like to join uh, Michael in thanking you, Professor Ryman. I'd like to thank the, the audience, which covers many different time zones uh, globally, which is very gratifying to see. Uh, there are many questions. I even have a couple of questions here which were sent to me that I tried to transmit to Professor Edelstein from uh, Carlos Martin and others. Very good questions. Uh, and hopefully, you know, maybe since they're recorded, they can be enlisted, they can be directed subsequently. I'd like to thank everyone who helped put together this first um, uh, seminar in the webinar series. Uh, David, uh, we learned a great deal, many, many important insights, and some of, some of us are in positions, uh, maybe Michael and others, to transmit these to decision makers in Israel, which could be very, very helpful and very useful. So this is not just of interest, it's a practical implication, hopefully. Professor Saban, the leadership of uh, Bar Ilan University, for uh, helping us recruit Michael, or enabling the recruitment, for putting, uh, supporting this webinar series, uh, and to all of those involved. Uh, our, our fondest good wishes for good health, uh, good thinking, good policy uh, going forward, uh, and all the best. And we'll see you in the next and continuing series. Thank you very, very much to everyone. Thank, Thank you, you for having invited me. Thank you. Bye bye.